one of the most important things I've learned from doing this blog is to remain skeptical at all times of, of trying to classify an entire generation or re remaining vigilant when it comes to just your preconceived notions about what a generation is supposed to believe. Welcome to Education Futures. I'm Paul Zenke. I'm glad to be joined today by renowned paleo-futurist Matt Novak. Novak's work examines past visions of the future, from technological visions like flying cars to social visions like libertarian moon colonies. Since starting his Paleo Future blog in 2007, Novak has written for many news outlets, including BBC Future, Slate, The Wall Street Journal, and TheAtlantic.com. Last week, Novak announced he was moving his Paleo Future blog from its current home at the Smithsonian website to Gizmodo. I began our conversation by discussing his blog, Paleo Future. Paleo Future is a blog that I have been doing for about six years and takes a look at past visions of the future. So everything from flying cars, jet packs, meal pills to social futures, things like utopias, dystopias, anything primarily from the second half of the 19th century onward, right up to the year 2000. Uh, when people were making predictions about what they thought the future would look like. And yeah, I've, I've had fun with it. Definitely. And, and so through this process of, of doing this site for a few years, what, what have you really learned through doing this work? And, and again, looking through archives and thinking through kind of social, social trends, what have you learned as part of this? One of the best pieces of advice that I ever got early on in looking at this topic, you know, I, I um, in 2008, I met up with uh, Brian Horgan, who curated an exhibit at the Smithsonian back in the early 80s called Yesterday's Tomorrows. And when I found the gallery book for that, you know, obviously it was, to me at the time, the retro future Bible. This work had already been done. I started the blog before I had even really knew of their work back in the early 80s. They were already looking back at 30s futures, 50s futures, and methodically going about studying it. I contacted Brian Horrigan, uh, and it turned out that he lived in St. Paul, where I lived at the time. And so we became fast friends, and he introduced me to Joe Korn, who was his co-author on the book and co-curator at the Smithsonian. One of the best pieces of advice that I got from Joe was that you really should be wary of trying to classify entire generations of people as a particular thing. And that, that was something that has really stuck with me because any time that I approach a particular vision of the future, it's really easy to classify it as, you know, if, if it adheres to our preconceived notions about what that generation, uh, whether it was baby boomers or millennials, you know, what, whatever a generation thinks about the future, you know, whether we think that, you know, baby boomers are uh, sort of, you know, grew up during good times and and are all think a certain way, you know, that, that's not always the case. And I, I think that to be skeptical, to remain skeptical of sort of studying history of the future in that way is is important, you know, looking at the Apollo space program. It's something that after I, I did some research on, discovered that it actually wasn't that popular for adults in the 1960s. Public approval of the program only once breached 51% of uh, adult Americans, and that was right after we landed on the moon. A plurality, at least, of Americans thought that it was a waste of money. Uh, looking further into, well, why is the popular narrative, why did people think that space was the future? And well, it was because, you know, all of the people that are telling these stories now are these baby boomers who were kids at the time. You know, when you're a kid, and you're looking at the space program, you're amazed about it, but you don't necessarily step back and, and look at the bigger picture and say, well, how are we allocating these funds? That's sort of the nuanced view that comes with being an adult. But the people that are telling the story of what the space program was like are the people that are now in power, you know, the people that are are politicians and that are running, you know, boardrooms, these people are the ones that will tell you that we decided we we're going to go to the moon and we went to the moon and it was great that everyone was behind it. It's a long, long answer to your short question. But one of the most important things I've learned from doing this blog is to remain skeptical at all times of, of trying to classify an entire generation or re remaining vigilant when it comes to just your preconceived notions about what a generation is supposed to believe. Thank you. That's that's fascinating. In, in reading your site, a lot of 
visions of the future, as you mentioned, come from people in power in one sense or, an, or another, right? So it's it's kind of popular culture things like like cartoons or or fiction books. It's a marketing that takes place in magazines or or again actual newspaper and magazine articles. How do you think the idea of power and uh, an authority and voice really kind of shape our ideas about about potential futures? Well, I think that it's it makes it much more tech centric. You know, when I when I talk about people that don't know necessarily what I do for a living, when they ask what I do, and I say that I write about past visions of the future, I immediately follow it up with flying cars, jetpacks, meal pills, the technological visions of the future, because they're the easiest touch points for people. You talk about sort of the social futures, it's harder for people to to grasp. And I think that so much of 20th century futurism, as you said, comes from popular culture, but also from advertising and from people trying to sell things. And and because of that, it tends to be a much more tech-centric vision of the future. The Jetsons, for example, you know, is a, a cartoon that debuted in 1962 and was very tech-centric. Jane, the wife, didn't leave the home. You know, what, what if the Jetsons had envisioned uh, w- more women in the workplace? You know, that's just what ifs that we don't, you know, obviously it's kind of silly to talk about a cartoon, but it is one of those what ifs that, you know, could have had very real consequences for how people thought about the future. I, I think futurism often is shiny gizmos and gadgets to a lot of people. And that's fine. That's interesting. I find that stuff interesting, but uh, I've tried with, you know, my blog to try and explore other aspects of futurism that aren't just the gee whiz flying car stuff. But yeah, I mean, even sometimes though, technological futures often have more interesting backstory that doesn't necessarily have to do with technology in every way. You know, for for example, meal pills have their roots in, in late 19th century feminist uh, novels. You know, the, it was seen as as one futuristic device that would be able to liberate women from the drudgery of the kitchen. You know, when we think of meal pills, we might think of space age visions of things, but often futurism is used like any genre to to talk about hard issues in a much more lighthearted way. That's great. So, so recently you gave a talk at South by Southwest uh, called Edison versus Tesla and the myth of the lone inventor. What inspired that talk and what is the myth of the lone inventor? Well, what inspired that talk was uh, there's a, a great cartoonist named Matthew Inman who runs a site called The Oatmeal. He did a, a comic about Nikola Tesla, which was pretty entertaining, but it was filled with all kinds of errors. But aside from the errors, what bothered me about the comic a little bit was the fact that he had held Nikola Tesla as up to be this person who invented our modern world. And and any time anyone makes the claim that a single man or single person invented something so broad as that, our entire world, our entire electrical system, and and the modern world we know today, you obviously have to be quite skeptical, as I was. So in, in doing more research about Tesla, you know, I, I discovered all of these things that I wanted to talk about, and BBC approached me to ask if I wanted to give a talk at South by Southwest. So you know, I just threw out this idea, you know, I'd love to talk about the myth of the lone inventor, which basically it has to do with the idea of innovation being something that isn't done in a vacuum. You know, we, we like to imagine the lone inventor, the nerdy, bespectacled genius who goes into his garage and emerges with a fully formed invention, which obviously isn't the way it's done. You know, it's it's how children, you know, elementary school children might understand invention in that way, and that's fine. We have to understand that innovation is really, really messy, that everyone is building on top of everyone else's ideas and and previous inventions. And, you know, there's simultaneous invention. People are constantly coming up with things at the same time. So it's it's really hard for people to understand this, but also we really like to have nerdy heroes, which is great. You know, it's it's great to have people that we can look up to. But once they start being idolized and once it starts becoming a religion of sorts, as I believe uh, Tesla has become in a very strange way in the last year, you start to understand the world in, in what I think is a dangerous way. I think that if we understand invention and innovation as one guy alone in a garage who who builds something, 
by himself, beholden to no one, I think that that has real world ramifications when it comes to things like intellectual property. And, and I talk a little bit about this uh, in my Southwest, Southwest talk in, in how something like prior art for the iPad needs to be acknowledged when it comes to uh, something like, you know, I've dug up a, a 1994 video concept video by Knight Ritter, you know, the huge newspaper conglomerate, the, the video of the newspaper of the future, and it looked identical to an iPad. So, you know, if, if iPad is going to sue Samsung over, they believe that Samsung is stealing their ideas over the look and feel of the iPad and the iPhone, well, where was Apple and, and what what sort of inspiration can you take from history and 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 still acknowledge without you know, I, I guess the long and short of it is you know the the real world ramifications of of how we think about invention is potentially harmful to future generations this is not to 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 begrudge any inventor their intellectual property rights i think that this is sort of what gets lost in the mix as well as people that assume that i must be some kind of information wants to be free anarchist and that I want to destroy all copyright and intellectual property protection when in fact it's quite the opposite. I believe that that in order for people to be compensated for their work, there there needs to be this intellectual property protection. But just how far reaching that is, we, we need to acknowledge that, that we need a healthy public domain. And I think that part of that comes from acknowledging that you didn't create this thing, whatever, however great it was and however unique you you think it is it wasn't created in a vacuum you were inspired by forces that you probably don't even know or acknowledge which means that there needs to be a, a set term limit for when these things you know right now we essentially have de facto infinite copyright uh which for me is seems like a dangerous precedent i think that a healthy public domain inspires new inventions i mean take a look at at walt disney you know some of the class many of the classic films like snow white pinocchio all these these things came from public domain stories and and they created their own version of it and then it doesn't and acknowledging that that you know you created something new and important out of something old uh, needs to be part of the discussion but yeah that no that's that's absolutely fascinating and certainly i'm very interested in your ideas on on education as well in your last of your 24 part series looking at the jetsons at 50 you discussed the idea of robot teachers. And in your post, you said, the idea of robot teachers in the classroom was so prevalent in the late 1950s and so abhorrent to some that the National Education Association had to assure Americans that new technology had the potential to improve education in the US and not destroy it. When you think about that idea of both robot teachers and also this, this very public response that the NEA made, what do you think that says about kind of the public's relationship to technology and, and education? There's always this push and pull when it comes to education. I think that we're always looking for different ways to make things more efficient or to automate different aspects of life. <clears throat> and when it comes to education, it's it's one of those sorts of, it's up there with baseball and apple pie when the school teacher is someone who is sacred in a lot of ways. Even people that today are trying to bust teachers unions and all that take a step back uh, every time because they know that you know you, you can't beat up on teachers too much they're uh, one of our most important assets in as a civilized society so when you s take a sort of cold robot figure and say you're going to replace a teacher with it that's uh, there's a sort of natural revulsion to well you know, what will that do to our children? When I was doing research for that, finding that that was such a prevalent idea that robots would one day replace teachers. But I think that you also see this sort of pushback in other forms of technology, not necessarily a humanoid robot replacing the teacher, but also sort of distance learning. There's a lot of debate going on right now, just, you know, as an outsider looking at, I think that these are obviously not new ideas. You know, I did another post a while back about television and sort of the hope for education when it came to educating people from a distance through television before uh, it was actually a thing. You know, there there was visions of being able to use television as a educational tool. And I, I think that you know, it seems like every broadcast medium actually has has gone through that really 
wide-eyed techno optimist stage where you know radio is supposed to be this great educational tool you know, television just the same you know the internet is obviously the next step in that and i'm interested in seeing how that ebbs and flows how people can be so wildly optimistic about a technology think that it's the savior and then it disappoints in a lot of ways but then it turns out that you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater you you take what works and you implement that as a tool just as all technology is a tool I, i'm interested i, I recently read uh, douglas rushkoff's new book uh, present shock and in it he describes kind of what he he thinks is the kind of the death of narrative and a result of that, he argues, is is both kind of this this prepper community, right? This very apocalyptic. The discussion last year around you know 2012, and then on the the, the technophile side, ideas like the singularity. In all your work and thinking about past ideas about the future, where do you get the sense that we're headed as a society? And uh, and have you noticed this trend towards these kind of different flavors of apocalyptic ideas in, in popular culture recently? When it comes to apocalyptic notions there to me there seems to be two things that spur that one is tough economic times you tend to see darker visions of our dystopian future when things aren't going so well you know the soylent green in the 1970s you know exposing fears around overpopulation and and food scarcity and all those sorts of things similar visions of robots in the 1930s and automation and that sort of stuff but there's also the strain that's sort of always there that's more of a nihilist sort of teenage version of the apocalyptic strain that will always be there. I, I think that even when times are great, you know, I grew up in the 90s and the late 90s, and things didn't feel as as apocalyptic. And yet there were still strains of, of that in the culture. I, I think it ebbs and flows with those two driving forces when it comes to apocalyptic fiction and preppers and that sort of stuff. But I think it's tied for, at least for a mainstream audience for the general population. It's very tied to, do I have a job? Or am I feeling all right? And I think that you you start to see if it goes on too long, even if you know if 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 the economic conditions are pretty terrible for a long time, you start to see people get a little tired of it. You know, the zombie fad I think of the last decade is starting to wear a little thin because people are frankly getting tired of seeing their misery. You know, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Sullivan's Travels. You know, in that movie, the protagonist discovers that people don't necessarily want to see their own misery depicted at them on screen. You know, we need some release sometimes. We need to watch the Mickey Mouse cartoons sometimes for a good laugh. And I, I think that you know, in my personal very limited view right now, I think you're starting to see a little bit of that. Even though, you know, shows like The Walking Dead are still incredibly popular, I think there's more of a drive to watch distractions that are a little more happy. Whenever I watch broadcast TV that isn't on Hulu or Netflix or something like that, I'm exposed to all kinds of things that I, I don't even know existed. You know, shows that are incredibly popular that I later learned that that I had no idea even were around. So I think that speaks to, I think, this, what I was talking earlier about how hard it is to classify or, or stereotype an entire generation, and arguably it's getting even harder. Sure, definitely. Do you have any new series planned on Paleo Future or uh, any new projects outside of the site that you're working on? Not really. No, you know, I'm I'm really interested these days in autonomous vehicles because I think you know, autonomous vehicles and humanoid robots, and I think that I'm going to be doing something pretty extensive shortly here around that because I, for me, that's been one of those promises of the future that has always been just over the horizon, but feels even more relevant today, uh, both those topics of obviously driverless cars and, and humanoid robots. I think we're much closer to driverless cars than we are humanoid robots, but there, there's been advances in robotics uh, recently that make me feel like we're, we're even closer than we were. But it's interesting because I, because my head is in the past so much and because I'm constantly looking at so many failed predictions for the future, I'm constantly skeptical of the people who are promising both for good or ill, whatever is supposedly going to happen tomorrow. It, what fascinates me about past visions of the future is the fact that it, it happens to illuminate every generation's greatest hopes and darkest fears. So it's it's interesting to see sort of what this generation, what we're planning for the future today. And I don't know that I can answer that 
Well, thank you. You've been incredibly generous with your time and especially when you're sick. So I, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Paul.